so grateful for Brett to have been able to be here with us last week. I don't know if uh, you know how hard it is to do what he did last week, actually. Uh, it's one thing, when I invite someone to speak in my place, I always say, just do whatever you want, right? Don't, I, I'm in the middle of a series, but don't try to do that, because it would be hard for someone else to step in and have the middle thought of a five-week series. And Brett said, oh, no, tell me what your, your topic was and what you're doing, and I'm, I'm curious. I might want to do that. And I said, okay, well, here's what I'm doing. And, and he actually went back and listened to the previous sermons, thought about where it was headed, and then wrote a magnificent sermon that said better than what I was going to say last week. It was a step up. So really just a magnificent job and so glad that he was able to do that. Now you're stuck again with me. Today we're going to take a look at this idea of taking the gospel to the nations and ask another question that comes up from time to time when we're talking about spreading the gospel in the global community. One of the concerns that comes up, especially in the last several decades, is are we exporting American values when we take the gospel around the world? One of the criticisms, and again, I just want you to hear it out. You can decide whether you think it's any good or not. But one of the criticisms of Christian missions has been that you're just going to places that aren't America and trying to make them Americans. You're trying to teach them how to look like us and act like us and be like us and, yes, worship like us. You're just exporting our politics and our ideas to some foreign land rather than uh, letting them be them. And words that come up will be words like colonialism. Like, you know, we've seen this before in the past where some empire went and said, now you're, now you're British and you're British and you're British and you're British. Uh, as Americans, we actually know that story. We were British and, and we know kind of how that works. And so that's one of the complaints, one of the concerns. And I'll say in all fairness, sometimes that does happen. There are people out there who make use of Christian institutions for reasons other than Christian purposes. Uh, that's certainly true. It's always been true. I suspect it will always be true. But there will be people who use the church as a means rather than an end. Quit doing that. That said, that's not the same as saying that that's what global missions are all about quite the opposite. And in fact, it's an opportunity to ask a much better question. Anytime you have a hard question, there's usually a better question lurking behind it. And I think the better question is, what is it we're trying to accomplish when we go and preach the gospel to the world? What's the nature of this gospel? Uh, my plan was to answer that question from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. And then, uh, but I made a typical preacher mistake. I started studying and I studied it and I said, you know, really to get verses 12 through 17, you need the context. You need to back up to at least verse 10 or 11. You know, to understand 10 and 11, you really got to back up to verse 1 and come forward. You know, to understand Matthew 4 verse 1, you really need chapter 3. And so today, the entire book of Matthew, now we're just going to do chapters 3 and 4, uh, but we will eventually get to the part that's my text and an answer to the question. Because it's back in Matthew chapter 3 that the question behind the question really comes to the forefront with a man named John the Baptist who is in the land of Judea. And in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the very first glimpse of what Christian missions might look like. Even before there is such a thing as Christianity as such, before there is a crucified and resurrected Savior, before there is the book of Acts or the Apostle Paul or the Great Commission or any of those things, there's John saying, here's the message we are taking starting here and later to the world. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so I think the better question then is, what did he mean by that? Because that's the message we're taking to the world today. And it's interesting even how he says it. Is he preaching something political? A little bit. When you think the word kingdom is a political entity, right? Kingdom is a, it's a government word. Kingdom, monarchy. Like it's a word. He could have said, I have a message for you. And he, I think he does say that sometimes. He could have said, I have a gospel for you. I have good news. He could have says, the prophecies of the Old Testament are coming to pass in our time. He says all those things. But what he chooses to say the most often, the kingdom is at hand. Something is arriving. 
of consequence. And so the question that comes out of that is, what kind of kingdom are we talking about? What is he preaching? You get a hint in the verses that follow. Because the first thing that happens are some people arrive and want in some way to react or respond to the message of John. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Someday, Ronnie, I'm going to start a sermon with the words, You brood of vipers. I've never been brave enough. But John, John just... All in, right? He, he sees the crowd. And it's a weird response, right? He's telling people, you need to repent and be baptized. And some people show up and they say, we'd like to repent and be baptized. And he says, snakes, <laughs> what's wrong with you? And it's also interesting how they're identified in Matthew's gospel. It's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You take our time capsule back in time for just a minute. We hear them linked together so much in the New Testament because both of them dislike Jesus that we forget the Pharisees and the Sadducees are absolute opposites on the social spectrum. The Pharisees are populists. They're, they're a common man. The Sadducees are elitists. The Pharisees are conservatives, believe in traditional Jewish values to a fault. Sadducees are progressives, believe the world's becoming Greek and Hellenized and we better get on board or we're gonna fall out of fashion. The Pharisees are rural people. Sadducees are living in urban centers, working in the temple in Jerusalem. These are fundamentally different groups of people. I mean, does that distinction even sound familiar? Populist conservatives, progressives on the other side, don't like each other. They both show up and want to be baptized, and John says, you're vipers, you're snakes. What does that tell us? Whatever the kingdom of heaven is, from step one, we can say the kingdom is not business as usual. The kingdom is not business as usual in Judea or anywhere else. He doesn't look at one group and say, he, he doesn't pick. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, one of you are a brood of vipers and the other are right. What he says is, both of you are in need of repentance, neither of you are prepared for what the kingdom of heaven is here to say. They viewed their whole world, again, tell me if this sounds familiar, they viewed their whole world and their whole society around this distinction. Are you one of these or are you one of those? And John says, you're all sinners and everything has to change. The kingdom is not business as usual. And then he dials it up, if you can believe that, and it gets worse. Even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That sounds kind of grim. And it has the word now in it. In days of old, the prophets would say, someday God will judge the nations. God's, uh, God's servant John says, even now the ax is at the root of the tree. It is starting at this moment. Is this hypothetical, John? No, this is imminent. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Sound like business as usual? No. <laughs> If anything, I think we can fairly say it's not, just businesses, it's not just not business as usual. The kingdom of heaven is the end of business as usual. It is a judgment against the way you have done things up till now. Which way you've done things? Both ways you've done things. Pharisee, coming to an end. Sadducee, coming to an end. Everything you thought was normal, coming to an end. If you are understanding what the kingdom is bringing, it is the end of how you thought life was supposed to go. So when you start there and you read that section, that's the kind of introduction then after the, Matthew 1 and 2 is the birth story, and now we're getting to the adult ministry of Jesus, and that's the introduction. John saying, here it comes. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And in the stories that follow, Jesus himself is connected to that message. We're going to summarize it very quickly. But first, Jesus comes and is baptized of John. Jesus, of course, wants to do this, he says, to fulfill all righteousness. John is concerned. He says, it should be the other way around. You're the one who I'm not worthy of. But Jesus says, no, it's important. And it is important for us to read, as readers to notice that this scene where Jesus is baptized of John connects then is John some lunatic in the wilderness? Maybe a little, but Jesus is baptized of John. What he's saying is connected to what Jesus is doing. And then after Jesus himself is baptized of John, heaven endorses this moment and this kingdom. A voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, the spirit descends in the form of a dove and all of heaven says, yes, this. So again, John's been shouting it, maybe he's crazy. Heaven says, no, he's not. This is the nature of the kingdom and it's come to you. And then the king of this kingdom goes to war. But he doesn't go to war with an army. Oddly enough, he goes to war by himself. The text says, the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil because he knows who his real enemy is. It's not actually the Pharisees, and it's not actually the Sadducees, and for that matter, it's not the Romans. The enemy is the devil, and he goes in the wilderness and has this personal conflict with Satan. I love to preach this passage. I'm gonna to try to abbreviate it today, because again, I really wanna talk about verses 12 through 17. But just notice that this is part of the story. John says, here comes the kingdom. The kingdom is the end of business as normal. Here is Jesus. He is the heir of that kingdom. He is the king of that kingdom. And he goes into the wilderness. And I believe what you see in the wilderness is Satan tempting Jesus with three perversions of what the kingdom would be. Or put another way, three versions of the kingdom if Satan had been in charge of it. And those are the three temptations of Christ. Let me just summarize them as quickly as I can. Number one is this, the appeal to make bread. Satan says, I know you're hungry. Here's a rock. Turn it into bread. And then that'll be that. Seems like a weird temptation when you think about it. Any, anything wrong with eating bread? No, I plan to eat some later. Anything wrong with turning stones into bread? Not that I'm aware of. Except maybe if you promised to be in a fast, and then you'd be breaking your fast. But beyond that, I mean, he voluntarily started the fast. I guess he could voluntarily stop the fast. What's the temptation here? I think it's broader than that. I think it's a point about the kingdom itself. What kind of king are you going to be? God in flesh for the first time is hungry. God, the whole world's been hungry all along. People are starving all over the planet. Has it occurred to you that you could snap your fingers and turn every rock into bread? What kind of kingdom are you actually bringing these people? Are you going to feed them? That's what Satan do, would do if he was in charge. He would use power to accomplish his goal. And worse, Jesus is capable of that. How do I know? Because he did it one time. There was an occasion when disciples came out and they were hungry and he says, do we have any food? And they got loaves and we got fishes and he fed all of them miraculously. He has that power. So why doesn't he just end world hunger with a snap of his finger? Why does he do it the way that he does it? Because the kingdom of heaven is different than that. The kingdom of he heaven is deeper than that. He says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus knows if he gives you bread, you'll be hungry again tomorrow. If he's taught you to be greedy, if he's taught you to take from your neighbor, if he has not cured the reason we hunger, if he has not changed us from the end, from within, there's no amount of bread that's ever going to fix that. We need what the kingdom is actually bringing us, the word of God. Okay, that didn't work. Well, become Superman then. That's the next temptation in Matthew. Here's something very tall. Jump off of that. Doesn't the Old Testament say the angels will catch you? Just jump. Use your power. Do something incredible. And again, in my mind, this is the kingdom if Satan were in charge. If he were the king of the kingdom, what would he do? He would show off. He would get you to believe in him by being amazingly powerful. He would do incredible feats of strength. He would 
jump over buildings in a single bound and be faster than a speeding bullet. He'd do all those things because it's all about him for him. And Jesus says, you'll not tempt the Lord your God. There is going to be works of power done. There will be things that you can't imagine. On a Sunday morning, the dead would come to life. But it's not going to be done to show off. It's not going to be done to prove something to Satan. It's not going to be done because I can. The goal of Jesus Christ is to do what it takes to save others, not himself. And then the third temptation is the most overtly political of them all. The text says, build an empire. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. I remember hearing a sermon once upon a time where the guy said, now this is another example of Satan being a liar. Satan can't give you a kingdom anyway. And I wanted to say, and I still say, oh yes he can. He does it all the time. How do you think people get kingdoms? You know, not, trying to, not trying to be super cynical, but people usually rise to power not by being especially humble. You don't become a world empire by being especially self-sacrificing and kind. What kind of person conquers the world? It's the Satan kind of people. He has offered that deal to every conqueror in human history, and they've taken it. Do things my way, have power over those people. It works. Alexander the Great, I mean, you name them all. Anybody who's gone anywhere and done anything found that he could use and harness the power of an earthly kingdom in a satanic way and accomplish what he wanted. He could even convince himself it was a good idea. That's how empires are built. Are you telling me Jesus couldn't do that? Some guy in Rome could do it, but Jesus couldn't? No way. If anybody could, it would be Jesus. In fact, and here's the greater temptation, I think Jesus would do a better job of it than the guy of Rome. Does anyone here doubt for a second that if we gave Jesus an army, as if he needed one, and he conquered the world, he would be a better dictator than any we've ever known? Satan says, you want it? Just take it. Just go do it. That's what I would do. And it's at this point that Jesus is the most vocal in his rejection because that's the point of the story. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. How is the kingdom going to be built? It'll be built God's way or not at all. It's not going to be built the way you think a kingdom shall be built. It will not be built on the blood of others. It would be built with his own blood. And the, that, that's the essential ingredient to that point. It's clear later in Matthew's gospel where he almost says this again, but not to Satan, to Peter. Later in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is telling them, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This is how I'm building my kingdom. This is how it's going to happen. And Peter took him aside and says, hey, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. This is not Satan trying to trip Jesus up. This is Peter, a believer. Peter says, you're the Messiah, you're the king of Israel. That's not how the story's supposed to go. You should go to Jerusalem. You could kill the other guys if you want, but it shouldn't be you. Peter's convinced of this. Remember in the garden, Peter's the one who literally draws a sword. He says, I know how this story's supposed to go. This will never happen to you. And what does Jesus say in response to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. For Jesus, he is right back in the wilderness again. And it's the same temptation. Build a kingdom the way that Satan would do it. Get behind me, Satan. He says, whose side are you on? You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You are thinking about a kingdom the way you would build a kingdom, which incidentally is the way Satan would be to build a kingdom. And Jesus says, that's not what we're doing here. This is something fundamentally different. The kingdom will not be built with business as usual. He's not going to use the old methods to get a slightly better result. He is doing something different from the ground up. 
and it is a rejection of not only the results, but of the methods we have used to attain our results. It is the rejection of everything from the ground up. So now finally, the verse I wanted to talk about like an hour ago, Matthew 4 and verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. This little section then is capping off this story that started with John. And what's happened to John? John has been arrested. Why is John arrested? The same reason Jesus is going to be crucified in one sense. Because the kingdom is threatening to business as usual. If you're in power, you can't have people roaming the countryside saying, repent, they're all sinners. That's got to stop. And so they arrest John. And how does Jesus respond to that? And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. That seems like a kind of anticlimactic verse for several reasons. One, he's going the wrong direction. Where should the Messiah go? He should go to Jerusalem. Instead, he goes north. It's the other way. And not only does he not go to Jerusalem, he doesn't go to the place where John has been arrested and spring him out of jail. I mean, if you really think about this now, the way a person's thinking about this in the first century, you're a king, you're building a kingdom. Your man, your cousin, your prophet has been arrested for saying you are the Messiah. What do you do? You go spring him out of jail. You get the boys together and you start a war. This is what you've been waiting on. Jesus instead goes the opposite direction and does the opposite thing. Not only that, Matthew wants you to notice that where he goes is significant. He goes to Zebulun and Naphtali, Pernium by the sea. What's important about this? This is not a place of great political power. It is quite the opposite. Years and years ago, centuries before this, this had been a great nation known as Israel in the north, or Ephraim. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians came down and wiped them out, and they never recovered. This is the part of the kingdom of Israel that had never recovered. It was the ruins of what had once been a kingdom. Isaiah himself, at the time of its destruction, had prophesied, and Matthew says, this kind of sounds like that to me. So that what might be spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun, the land of Nephtali, the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Matthew says this is an incidental that he's there. Jesus went to the place where business as usual had done its worst where you could see the ruins of the exercise of satanic power, where you could see what empire building cost our fellow man, where you could see the wreckage of kingdoms. And Isaiah said, someday God's going to show you his life even there. And Matthew said, that's exactly where he went. And what did he do when he got there? My favorite verse in Matthew 4. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, don't miss the power of that statement. Jesus doesn't raise an army. He doesn't go get John out of prison. He doesn't even go to Jerusalem and make his claim as king. He leaves his friend in prison. He goes to the weakest land, the ruins of a once great nation, and he stands there and repeats verbatim the words that got John arrested. And he says to the kingdoms of the earth, bring it on. Doesn't change a word of it. This would be a great time to say, clearly you're misunderstanding this kingdom thing. I need to reword it in some way. He says, no, you actually understand. Good, you feel threatened. Repent for the kingdom of heaven at hand. The kingdom will not be silenced by business as usual. And not only that, from this time forward, he's going to start enlisting people to say the same thing. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, 
I'll make you fishers of men, immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them immediately. They left the boat and their father and followed him. What does Jesus do? He takes that controversial message, the one that got his friend arrested, and he says, that's it. Come on, boys. And he rounds up friends, new friends that he hadn't met yet, <laughs> rounds up people, doesn't draft them, just invites them and says, we're going to go and take this message that got a man arrested and eventually killed, and we're going to go take it to the world, one person at a time. Want to go? And they say, sure. And these people understand it because they literally leave business as usual, not empire business or political business, but economic business. They're literally sitting in their business in a boat with their nets by the sea, and Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you have to leave that, and they leave it behind. The kingdom is enlisting disciples out of business as usual and into something new. Do you see the scope of that and what we're trying to say? Our original question, I know it sounds like it's a way in the rearview mirror, but stay with it. Our original question, are we exporting American values? Is this some kind of nationalist strategy? And what you see in the kingdom of heaven is something so great and so different. The kingdom of heaven, uh oh, can you give me my last slide, Susan? I punched too many buttons, got excited about my last point. The kingdom of Jesus is the end of business as usual in every nation. Everywhere the kingdom goes, it says, no, 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 not like this, but this. How do I know we're not exporting American values around the world? Because the kingdom of heaven says the same thing to us. Because the kingdom of heaven says you need to repent. The Pharisee and the Sadducee, the Republican and the Democrat, everybody needs to repent. It looks at what we're doing, it looks at our economics, it looks at our sense of self and our concerns and our, all of our philosophies that we build our lives around. And he says, no, not that. The ax is laid at the root of the tree. And every kingdom on the earth, the kingdom of heaven says, no, not that, but something better. And it pays the price for saying it. Take some time today and contemplate, not this fear that we might accidentally export our values to some other place, but instead think about this. In what way is the kingdom of heaven demanding that you reject life as you know it? Bow with me in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, help us to hear this sermon as center, sinners in need of repentance. Help us to see your kingdom as the threat that it is to our daily lives. Help us to see it as something new, something to judge us, to remake us, and send us out with purpose to do your will. Forgive us where we have failed, and we have failed so very much. Help us to follow your Son and to know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This we pray in his name. Amen.